Hello, family members. I hope you're having a nice day today. I'm going to talk to you today about uh, something that happened yesterday. I was taking a nap, woke up, and it was all over YouTube, and I'm sure every other media <laughs> uh, worldwide, about our felon, former president, convicted felon, Donald John Trump. Hmm. And, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of uh, mixed reactions on it, you know. Even even in the anti-Trump crowd, some people are just blissful and happy. Some are cynical. Some believe it's going to make a big difference in the election. Some don't. You know, there's uh, a lot of, of reactions to it. You know, cheering. <laughs> some people are just happy, you know. I, though, would rather talk about how we got here how we got to the point where the all but assured uh, Republican nominee for president is a convicted felon and very openly uh, unfaithful to his spouses and uh, you know does uh, really questionable business practices and all this. How, how did we get here? How did this happen, you know? And there's no, of course, clear starting point, obviously. This is, you could trace this back probably to Reagan and, and some of the stuff that he did um, and some of the attitudes that he fostered but I want to start with the year 2000. In the year 2000, I turned 18 and I voted for the very first time. And I voted for Al Gore, who got the popular vote, but the Supreme Court decided he should be president. And ever since then, we've had 2004, 2008, 2012, 2016, 2020, we've had five elections. Out of those five, the Republican got the popular vote once. Once. But we had 2000, where the Republican did not get the popular vote and got to become president. And then the term, the second term, which broke my heart and I couldn't believe that people would actually vote for somebody who lied us into an illegal war that created ISIS, but you know. But he didn't have the benefit as of hindsight there and it was only completely obvious that he was horrible. Uh, but you know, only if you were paying attention, right? Well anyway. And then Donald Trump's presidency, which now, legally, I can say that he won after behaving in criminal ways to influence the election. That's been adjudicated. That's, that's the truth, the legal truth. He cheated in the 2016 election barely eked out a win despite not getting the popular vote and was very obviously very uh, thoroughly documented that he received an awful lot of support from Russia. So we have a, a criminal <laughs> person supported by Russia foreign agent, uh, adversarial nation, who was able to take over our country despite not getting the popular vote. <laughs> How did we get here? You know? And 
I think that it, you, the very first start, you have to go back to Al Gore v. Bush. That is when the Republican Party started exerting its power in the Supreme Court to undermine democracy, undermine the value of uh, the votes of, of the United States, of the people. And it started there. Uh, and then from there, they realized they were able to get away with that. And we have all this, you know, explicit racial gerrymandering, all these maps that have been struck down even by a court that is not favorable <laughs> to justice. Um, we had at that point an inflection point where the Republican Party realized that its best opportunity to execute its worldview was not to convince the American people to do things their way, but rather to game the system so that they couldn't lose power. And once they had that power, do whatever it is that they believe is right, no matter what the people of the United States want or need from them. And it's over the last nearly 25 years that's become such an a overt strategy that we barely even think about the fact that when Americans are polled about issues like gun control, marijuana legalization, um, you know, public health care options, all these things are wildly popular, but it would not be possible whatsoever to get any sort of legislation through Congress to execute the will of the people. We don't have representative de democracy at this point. The Congress is unable to legislate in a way that reflects what the people of the United States want. We're supposed to be by the people, for the people, but right now what we are is a country where the Republican Party has decided that it wants to try to pick its voters instead of letting its voters pick the leaders of the party. And when reality does not conform to what they would like to do, then they deny things, they make up facts, you know. I wonder very much what difference there would be in the world today if we had had a president in 2000 who did not question the obvious consensus that was well known for decades at that point that the earth was warming it was caused by humans and we need to do something about it. Imagine if American policy had been for the last 25 years, basically, pro, you know, environmental justice. <sighs> I mean, the amount of lives that, that we wouldn't have lost are just impossible to calculate. You know, climate change was accelerated by what the Supreme Court did in handing that election to George Bush. And that accelerated uh, climate change has killed people. And, you know, some of those deaths probably might not be avoidable, but some of them are. If we had taken action 25 years ago to start actually doing something about this, to actually, you know, invest in public transportation and solar and wind energy and other sources 
of renewables and you know had done something about plastic waste we would be in a much different situation than we are right now because the united states is still a bit of a global leader here we are losing a lot of our power because of the fact that the republicans have decided to break the system in order to take over the system and so of course that's definitely taken down um, our appearance to our <laughs> global neighbors right but we're still influential enough that if we had taken a proactive stance on climate change that i'm certain our actions would not have been the only positive difference there would have been other countries that made changes and we would have encouraged them you know we would have potentially um provided aid to third world countries to combat um, some of the effects of climate change. You know, maybe we, we would have worked with Brazil to help them figure out something uh, for their, um, you know, farmers so that they wouldn't feel the need to continually burn down the rainforest, you know? I mean, this is a complex web of interactions between different countries and we could have done so much, but instead of doing anything, we tried to suppress the science, tried to go la 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 and pretend we didn't know what was going on and pretend that it wasn't happening and pretend it wasn't our fault and pretend we don't need to do anything about it. And we had eight years of that, eight years, you know? And, you know, Obama, Obama did a lot while he was in office. I mean, I'm very grateful for the Affordable Health Care Act because otherwise I'd be really in bad place. I mean, I'm already in a very bad place. But, you know, one thing at least. But, you know, he didn't have any, any chance of doing much on climate change because it becomes so entrenched within Republican politics that you had to deny it, had to pretend it wasn't happening. And so, you know, the political uh, situation had festered for eight years and become so entrenched that it's almost impossible to move people past this, uh, you know, climate change denial because it's, it's not just uh, an opinion, it's a cultural signifier, you know? Um, conservatives are a lot about uh, conformity, you know? And about maintaining the status quo. And they're very uncomfortable with things that challenge that. And to extend, I understand that, you know, that's a, that's a human trait. That's, it's not universal that, that people are excited about change or variety or, um, you know, things like that, things that challenge them. However, for some reason, they expect people outside of their community you know their their social circle to conform and be the way that they are and they believe very firmly that their way is the right way no matter what it is that the people want and that attitude did not start in 2016 And the antagonism started in the 90s. You know, Newt Gingrich really did a lot to demonize and dehumanize Democrats in the eyes of Republicans. And once you have convinced the people that are your, your rabid voted in base that are highly motivated to come out and vote uh, out of spite, <laughs> or out of fear 
you know. Fear and, and anger are really motivating forces. And, you know, Republicans use that to their advantage. They use the, our country's apathy to concentrate the anger and, and uh, fear of their base to make them very motivated to vote so that they were able to uh, collate a voting bloc that would outweigh the number of people who weren't out in their extremist voting bloc that actually voted because so many people don't vote. And the people who could see what was happening and cared enough to vote against what they were trying to do just were not able to reach the people who were apathetic. And when Obama was elected, I think that a lot of the, the reason that there was energy for him was because he was so unconventional as a candidate. And I think that in a lot of ways, that's why the extremists in the Republican Party responded to Obama with Trump. They, they looked at Obama as sort of an affront to them. You know, how dare you put this black man in the White House? You know, a black Democrat. How dare you, right? And so they, out of spite, picked the most inappropriate candidate they could because they knew it would make other people upset. And that is what they want. They have decided it's uh, them versus us, and us is everyone who isn't with them and marching in lockstep with them. So, you know, even people like Liz Cheney is part of the, uh, the other to them, you know. Even though she's very, very, very conservative, that's not enough. It's not enough. So... <laughs> They created this block that they had control of that could get them just enough votes to stay in power. Not enough votes to actually have the support of the people, but enough votes to stay in power. And they became beholden to that block. The block that they first started out leading is now leading them. And it's sort of a gross symbiotic relationship, you know. There's Donald Trump definitely has made overtures since the overturning of Roe to, uh, well, not so much the overturning of Roe, since the last midterm election. And it was obvious that the overturning of Roe was actually going to make a difference at the ballot box. And he's tried to kind of distance himself a little bit from that and and it wasn't possible his supporters would not accept him doing that Kimmy is wagging her tail that's why there's a little flashing light she was standing in the sun I'm sorry but um, he can't make certain changes even if he wanted to you know he can lead these people to a certain extent, you know, if he says, I didn't do a bad thing, they're lying, the people will follow that. But if he tries to touch one of their sacred cows, like gun control or abortion or uh, homeschooling probably would be a good one as well, uh, you know, raising taxes, you know, things like that. Uh, if he tried to touch any of those, the, the, they would bat him down so hard and so fast because they are a decentralized cult. They have no true leader. The leader is the anger and the frustration and the resentment that they have. 
and these ideas that they have fully committed themselves to, like anti-climate change, anti-vaccination, anti-queer, anti-trans, anti-woman, anti-person of color, anti-woke, you know, whatever they think woke means, right? And those positions are what guide them, not any one person. And so if what you want is somebody who's going to put your, your policies in place and all of your extreme positions and not care about what most people in America think or want about that, then, you know, it's probably a pretty good idea to just pick whoever, you know, and somebody who isn't necessarily going to be politically savvy and care about the broader implications, who's only going to care about how it looks to their base and is going to hype them up. And, and tell them how great they are and how smart they are and how silly everybody else is and how wrong everybody else is. You know, that's exactly what conservatives have been cultivated to want is somebody who's going to tell them exactly what they want to hear, exactly how they want to hear it, and is going to make other people angry in the process you know uh, they they have this fantasy that other people are like just bitterly crying at everything they do and it's just it's sad it's sad you know like their whole existence is centered around opposition contrariness denying other people denying other people's rights other people's humanity and it's a very strange thing. It's a strange thing to center your existence around, especially if you're going to take up the mantle of being Christian, right? <laughs> like, we're supposed to care about the least of these. We're supposed to, you know, be like the Good Samaritan and take care of a stranger in need and, and welcome uh, people and wash the feet of, of the undesirables of society, you know, supplicate ourselves. Uh, um, to them and take care of them and that is in direct opposition with what they want and the positions that they've taken but yet they have this very faux Christian identity that they've grafted on like Donald Trump doesn't care or know anything really about Christianity. I mean, we know that, the two Corinthians thing, the fact that he went and stood in front of a church, you know, had uh, armed people go m remove protesters so he could stand in front of a church and hold a Bible upside down. <laughs> the fact that he can't say a single Bible verse that is his favorite or that he likes, you know, uh, he doesn't care but he's willing to say that he cares and that's all they care about they only care about the narrative and how he can make it appear because they have cultivated the republican party has cultivated uh, since at least the 80s and definitely the 90s a uh, electorate a, a voter base that has been told over and over again that it is the way you think it is. You don't need to reconsider. You don't need to think again. You don't need to think. Just follow what we tell you because that's just common sense. But they're wrong. They're wrong. Now, uh, they are a very small number of people, really. Uh, the, the, the true diehard voter base is not 
the majority by any means in this country. And the only hope that we have is that the reality check that the apathetic people that don't normally vote got when our bodily autonomy was taken away from us, when it became possible to ban a medically necessary medical treatment that people need to not die. That made people realize something is really wrong here and has broken a lot of that apathy. But it remains to be seen if that's going to make a difference at the ballot box this year or not. Now, I have some hope for my home state here, Florida, uh, because we have things on the ballot um, like uh, abortion rights and uh, marijuana rights, which, you know, it makes a huge difference in my ability to function, whether or not I have that. It is medicine, and whatever anyone thinks about it is it shouldn't be le illegal the way it is fully banned and I think that there are a lot of people who know and believe that as well and I'm hoping that that's going to motivate people to vote that don't normally do both of those issues and we're not the only places where those issues are on the ballot and so I, I hope I hope that people care enough to actually go and vote all of the Republicans we can vote out, out. Because their party has self-destructed. It is a, a, a chicken with its head cut off and it's just running around and they don't have a clear vision. They haven't had a platform in like, what? <laughs> a decade or something? I mean, they exist to perpetuate their own existence and to keep their own power. And they don't care about anything other than their place in society being maintained. And that goes for the voters as much as the actual politicians, is they are absolutely afraid of losing power. And this is all that they care about. And that is corruption. Power is a corrupting force. And if all you care about is, is power, then you are not going to be able to avoid the temptation to be corrupt. That's just a natural consequence. Well, anyway. <laughs> oh, BB says that it's maybe time for me to do something other than just talk at you. So I, I'll probably listen to her. She's usually pretty smart. What do you think, B? <laughs> well, family members, uh, we got here. We're here. You know, the, the, the most important thing that we can do at this point is just care. <laughs> vote. You know, encourage other people to vote, especially if you know that they're not the kind of people who would normally vote. So, you, know, you can write to your politicians. You can vote. Maybe donate volunteer if you can you know there's really not much more important things to do right now than ensure that uh, this country does not turn into a dictatorship because there are people a lot of people in the Republican Party that think that would be a very desirable outcome and that's terrifying so. all right I will Pay attention to you now, baby. Oh, ow. She stepped on my hip bone. Ow. All right. Take care, yourselves. Love you. Bye. <laughs>